Okay, Dr. Ma, thank you for talking to me. Uh, we, we've never met in person. Uh, this is all done <laughs> through the World Wide Web. Um, I think I came across your, your column in the newspapers, and I thought what you wrote was very original, mm -hmm. uh, very on point in terms of where this virus is going. But maybe we can just start with telling me who you are, right? Because I don't really know the full picture of who you are. Sure. Okay. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm a Malaysian, and I'm happy to be on your show. I, I've worked with the civil service for about 36 years. I train as a pediatrician. I also train in public health. So I hold two postgraduates, both pediatrics and public health. And uh, I, I ran the pediatric department in Ipoh Hospital, and as well as I ran the research department in Ipoh Hospital. So I did that for many years, and I retired about a year plus ago. I'm also an avid bird watcher. Okay, interesting. I can tell from your Twitter page, Twitter thing. Um, but you've also written a lot of pieces. I, I noticed you're quite prolific. And I, when I came across the article, it was a co-written by with with you, with also a Dr. Lim. Yeah. I was quite intrigued because all your pieces are written co-written with this person. So who is this person? Well, that's my wife. We've been married for about thirty-seven years, and uh, you know, I thought that piece, especially an exit strategy was very important to have more thinking. And so we've been think, talking about that for many days. And so we decided to write that together to try and stimulate some dialogue in the country. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting because um, not many people have gone beyond being stuck at the moment. I mean, we're just trying to live day to day. Yes. Um, so if you could just flesh, you had, you had three scenarios, right? Yes. Um, one was quite dire, one was less dire, and then one was more realistic. Just tell us about that. Yeah, I think there can be even more scenarios for that. But let's talk about just the basic ones. The basic one first is that we stop all that we're doing and let the virus spread. You know, uh, uh, the only problem is how big will the epidemic be before it stops? For an epidemic to stop, it must infect maybe 60, 70% of the population so that it doesn't spread so easily anymore. And if you look at the numbers then, you know, for every 100 infected, 80 are going to be fairly okay, sick but not needing hospitalization. 15 are going to require oxygen. Five are going to require intensive care. And in the good case scenario, 1% are going to die. But in that kind of epidemic, when we have an explosive epidemic with no controls on it, the healthcare system is not going to be able to cope. And I think that we're not going to provide the ICU beds, let alone provide enough oxygen for all the 15% who need it. So I think the mortality is going to be enormous. I've been very conservative in the article about the size of mortality, but you're looking at probably 5% of the Malaysian population, which is actually an enormous mortality. I think it's, it's grief. So that scenario is a grief scenario, uh, like what you see in Italy happening right now. Huh? But even Italy ha has controlled it to some degree. The second scenario is one where we uh, try and actually save the people who are highest at risk, which means the people past 60, the people who have got a lot of uh, what are called comorbids, which means hypertension, diabetes, chronic diseases. And then the third group is probably children who are immunocompromised or stuff like that. And somehow we isolate them. We put them in communities where they can be kept away from the rest of the public. And the rest of us carry on our life. Some of us are going to be sick. A few of us may die or get very severely ill. But generally, this will allow the virus to spread to the community develop a herd immunity, and then at that time, we reintroduce our older people as well as those who are at risk. It's not an easy undertaking, you know, where are we going to create all these facilities, how are we going to feed them, how, how are we going to prevent viruses from reaching them, it, it's not an easy strategy. So the third one is something that many people in the world have been talking about, it's called the hammer and the dance. I didn't put that in the article, but that's how we talked about, which means we relax the MCO gradually, we try to get back to some degree of life with the view that the virus is going to flare up intermittently and we're going to get outbreaks in many parts of the country. At that time, the hammer needs to come down, so maybe we might shut down Ipoh or we might shut down maybe uh, uh, Perlis where the virus is going and they have a very strict MCO going while the rest of us are continuing. So anywhere there's an outbreak, we have to step in and put in a restriction order while the rest of us continue. And that's not an easy dance. It requires a lot of testing ability. It requires people to continue doing uh, safe distancing. I think people have called it social distancing and then physical distancing. I think the current word that many people are using is safe distancing, but to continue practicing that. Food, food uh, locations have to change their habits. Supermarkets have to change. 
workplaces have to be modified. So it depends on the whole population getting the act together for the third scenario to work. We just cannot move from MCO back to normality in life as we know it. There is no more the old normality. We have to find a new normality. So this third one requires an extremely disciplined society. I think mask wearing will should be part of this third scenario as well. Routine mask wearing outside the home. So that's quite a dystopian um, opinion, Doc. Uh, Amar, <laughs> hmm. among friends. Um, what what is the um, the size of the dilemma facing the government right now? And I mean, bearing in mind, this is a basically a fledgling government. Okay, yes. with some senior ministers in there from before. Great. So I think the dilemma facing them is they worry about the economy. Of course, they worry about the health impact and deaths and, and the impact on, on the people and whether the health system can cope. And so that's the first one. Can the health system cope? Can we keep our deaths down? I think that's their primary worry. But the second worry, which is a growing worry, is what's the economy going to be like? Are, are we going to survive this? Is it going to be so painful that many people lose their businesses, people go bankrupt and stuff like that? But the third one, which I think is not adequately addressed in the country, it must be given attention, and that's the poor people. Have we allocated enough uh, resources to those who are really poor, those who are marginalized, Orang Asli, penance, inner city, immigrants, uh, the people who have been serving us? Uh, if we don't allocate enough responses to them, I think their mortality is going to be big. So while we may lose some people, from the coronavirus, we also lose some people from starvation, from despair, from suicide, and also from not being able to access health services as they normally could. So I think there are three things that they're trying to balance, and it's, it's a very difficult balance for anyone to do. You see, people are looking at the daily numbers as indicator of epidemic. I'm not. That's the last thing I'm looking at. I look at, you know, the subtle data. How many of our people with pneumonia have coronavirus? How many people with uh, influenza-like illness have coronavirus? How many tests are we doing? Those are better indicators. So I think right now our epidemic is spreading. We have to assume it's in the community, that the average person out there has got the coronavirus and is spreading it to others if they come in contact. So I think uh, the government knows that reality and uh, trying to adjust for that reality. The MCO is critical. It is a break in transmission, as Lee Kuan Yew said. You know, it is a circuit breaker. That's a nice, nice word that he used. So I think we are using it as such. Unfortunately, not everyone is compliant. I wish we were as compliant as the Chinese population, or maybe they were forced to be compliant, or we're as compliant as the Korean population, which I think is a spectacular population. If we did that, I think then the MCO could be shortened. Otherwise, we're going to have to extend it. Do you think that um, life as we know it has irreparably gone, um, Doc? Oh, that's a tough one. You know, I'm, I'm actually hoping to get back to my bird watching, you know, to supporting people on the ground, to working with NGOs, things that I, I do all the time. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be, I've been confined to my house. I'm a high risk individual, one of those who, you know, are at risk of dying. Uh, I, I would definitely wouldn't want to be confined to my house. And I'm extremely worried for the poor and those in need. So I definitely would like to get back to some degree of normality, but we have to be realistic. I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist, I'm a realist. And I think the realistic reality is that very small numbers of the population have been infected, small percentage, even in, for example, take a Wuhan, I think less than 5% of the entire population of Wuhan has been infected. So they have no herd immunity. The moment they release their restriction order in a major way, you just require one or two people with the virus to spread it to large numbers again, and then we'll have another outbreak. So I think, yeah we cannot go back to the previous normality. We have to find a new normality, but one that supports everybody in the community. Not easy at all. Um, there's a sense that among healthier guys, right, the heart healthy people, yes. <clears throat> there's an element of viral loading that you can yes. do. So basically you expose yourself and then you build up a natural immunity to it, right? That's the first thing, whether yes. it exists. Se secondly, how do you rate the um, possibility of a second wave of, of uh, infections? and if so, how much bigger can that be? Okay, let me answer the second one first. I think unless the coronavirus dies out in the entire world, some of us actually been pushing for an international, every country strict lockout, lockdown, so that we can actually hold this thing together. But I think there's been no consensus, no leadership for that. So if you, uh, you know, that can't happen. So 
I don't think the coronavirus can die out. So if it can't die out, it's a guarantee, it's a given that every country is going to see epidemics uh, and maybe even larger ones than the one we're seeing right now. So the second, the first question is, should younger people get exposed? Definitely, we know that the mortality is very low, under 30. And, you know, it is one of the strategies that people have been considering. I didn't want to consider writing it too hard because, you know, it's, it's a frightening thing. If you want to expose yourself to coronavirus, I think you better do it carefully. One thing that's not being discussed is virus load. If you have exposure to large amounts of the virus at the very beginning, you actually may get a more severe infection than someone who's exposed to a smaller uh, volume of viral load in a sense. So be very careful with that. Even young people, some are going to die. We have reports now overseas of children, of young adults dying as well. So it's not innocuous. It's not a strategy without its risk. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how we actually implement it clinically. It's just something that the population will decide to do. I, I, I suspect that is a strategy that people will take. The, the, the cure is so difficult that people decide, let's just abandon this and go on, which is why I wrote that first scenario as a possibility. I think to do this one, we need antibody tests. The current test we're using is the uh, polymerase chain uh, reaction test, PCR test, which take a lot of time and effort and reagents to do. If you can develop a rapid antibody test to show that you have developed antibodies to the virus, then I think this strategy you're suggesting can work. Then people can go about their business, get exposed, get infected. We test them, they're immune, and then we say, okay, fine, you carry an immune card. You are a person who can now travel safely, can work safely because you are immune to coronavirus. Assuming that they can't get reinfected and assuming the immunity lasts for a long time, both those things are not well known yet. I think there's a sense that not many people are being tested right now. I think the as a percentage, I think their focus is on high risk groups now. So there's right. not enough testing that really happening, let alone uh, uh, involve a more sophisticated form of testing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think MOH strategy is to do targeted testing rather than mass testing. So I think that's because they're doing the PCR test. I think once they can ramp up their testing or get antibody testing available, I think then they probably will offer a, a wider range of testing. Right now, there are about 34 labs involved in testing, and I think they're still working to enlarge the capacity. Yeah, so, okay, moving away from the dire situation, Amar, yeah. um, I, I, I also saw a piece that you wrote in your mm -hmm. farewell to the Malaysian Pediatrics Association. I found it very touching. Thank you. And I found it very uh, original in the sense that not many people talk. I mean, many people will feel this way, but they don't talk this way, right? Let alone mm -hmm. act this way. So that... Sure. that um, Alignment of behavior is very Gandhi-esque, I think. A lot of people don't realize the importance of that alignment. Um, let's start with leadership, right? Uh, obviously, there's been a leadership vacuum uh, mm -hmm. at, all, at all levels of society now. Um, what kind of person do you think is apt and appropriate to lead society in this current day and age? I think that, you know, the problem in Malaysia is that we've developed a style of leadership where you don't conflict with your boss, you, you don't criticize your boss, basically bootlickers or you know, your people who, who butter up their boss. And this is a hierarchical structure that we have actually created. And this kind of hierarchical structure is actually very dangerous because it doesn't allow for originality, for new ideas to come up. The kind of leadership I'm looking for is one where people can criticize, can dissent, disagree professionally. Uh, and I think uh, many people can't cope with disagreements. They take criticisms personally and they don't take it professionally. For me, I always tell my colleagues, Please say the negative things, the bad things about me in front of me, the good things behind me, because I don't need to hear those. I want to hear the things that challenge me, uh, where we are making mistakes, where we need to go. And I want to take those on board, process them, and use them to both grow myself as well as grow the organization and move forward. So in our country, we have an entire fabric of people in the civil service who have actually grown up, uh, you know, never challenging their boss because that's dangerous. You never get promoted, you might lose your job, and so on. So that's not easy to change overnight. If you ask me how to build leadership, I think one experiment would be to actually control, often delete, restart completely with a fresh bunch of young leaders, maybe 20s to 40 year old. But I think that's an experiment that we're not brave enough to do. You know, One person I thank very much in my life is our previous Prime Minister, Abdullah Badawi, who gave us a voice. He, he kept saying, tell me until I listen. And I think we need leaders like that in our country. So it's a hard set. I think the heart of many people live in fear in, in our country and we dare not speak up. 
And I think any government that wants to be real and wants to progress must encourage people to speak up. Okay, so the possibilities of that um, particular uh, permutation, let's leave it up to the future to decide for us, okay? The second thing you talked about, Doctor, is the fact that it's, uh, it's very important to avoid um, aspiring to money, power, uh, wealth, uh, fame. Yes. These are the traditional markers of success in society. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I, I think as you rightly said, I think uh, this is how society benchmark itself. If you've got a lot of money, uh, you got, you're very famous or, you know, you're very powerful. I think this is a three marks of success. In fact, uh, parents also look at that when they children be doctors or lawyers or stuff like that, want them to have a house with a swimming pool. But I find that, you know, these are not very important things. In the sum total of your life, these actually are not critical. Like the coronavirus is showing right now that these are not very important things in life. To me, I benchmark my life by three marks of success. The first one is how good is my relationship with God? Is it growing? Do I know God well? And secondly, how good is my relationship with myself? Do I know myself and am I progressing in life and, and changing? And thirdly, do I have a few good friends who are my, what I call soul or spirit friends, people who are always there for me through thick and thin. So you can see that I benchmark my life by relationships, three relationships. And that's, I think, a more valuable way to, uh, you know, to see our life and the success in our life. Uh, I always ask myself, how much do I really need to live on? Uh, my wife and I try and give away as much of our wealth as possible. We, we calculated that we need about $2,000 uh, to live on a month. That's it. And even with my pension and some savings, there's a lot to give away to other people. So I think keeping all this, is, all your wealth is actually a, is, it's a, it's a useless thing in life, I think. And too much fame can be harmful. And power can unmask you for what you really are. And then actually that may be frightening if you're in that position. Again, I mean, as a cultural norm, even as a psychological hurdle to overcome, that sounds yes. almost impossible because people want to hoard wealth, right? They want to give it down to future generations. They want to keep it within the family. And that's a very Asian thing. Mm. Yes, but you look at the children of people who are very rich, most of them poorly. I think that's why Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are very smart. They're giving away the vast majority of their wealth and leaving very little for their children. So I think too much wealth being passed down does not enable your own children to grow and make themselves. So I, I would encourage parents not to give too much to their children, just a little bit to start out in life and then let them, you know, make their own progress in life. You also talk about the importance of faith, right? Um, in, in some cases, among the atheists, uh, faith doesn't exist, but the importance of believing in something. Yeah. Um, how highly would you rate that? Or is that the number one thing? I think that, you know, faith has always been my guide for life. Uh, in life, you have many push factors, I believe. You know, you, for example, in the civil service, constantly we have push factors to push us out. A lot of my colleagues have gone out the prior practice because... It's a difficult environment to work in, you know. Uh, your boss may be uh, a problem uh, working with and, you know, your, your gaji may not be very good and, you know, the environment may not be very good. But I always work from pull factors. And for pull factors to happen, you need to have faith. You need to believe in God. You need to listen to the voice of God. The voices of this world are very, very loud and, you know, sometimes incessant. Uh, but the voice of God actually is gentle and soft and you need, to, you need to pay attention to listen to it. So one of the things I put into my life for more than 30, 40 years is to have solitude. Every morning, my wife and I wake up at four plus and we both spend time together as well as individually in solitude to listen to God. That means eyes closed, uh, don't listen to your brain, listen from your spirit, your core of your being to what God is saying. And if you do that, I think then you see the bigger things in life. You see the more uh, meaningful things in life. I have a very, very kind place for atheists. I think atheists are very real individuals. And I think they believe very strongly in many things, you know. Uh, they believe in truth, in justice, in reality, in hope. And I think uh, in the absence of belief in God, I think those are very powerful things to believe in. And I also believe in them as well. I like the fact that you mentioned four o'clock in the morning. That's when people are normally very deep in sleep. But it is also the most uh, appropriate time. Yes. Uh, I, think, I think lastly, Amar, you talked about the briefness of life. And I think a lot of people don't realize. They think that life goes on forever, ad infinitum, yes. right? Um, yeah. How important is it to realize that life is very, very brief? 
I think it's very important. I think as a culture, as a society, we don't talk about death enough. Death is kind of like pantang for us to talk about, you know. Uh, you know, um, for me, I think personally, I've had a couple of near-death experiences, uh, partly from health and uh, occasionally on the road. You know, you've had a really horrific near miss, and then you recognize that actually these things are very transient. What you take for granted, you think, okay, I'm going to live to 70, 80, so I can push off to tomorrow what I want to do today. I often tell people because of those experiences, I finished my bucket list before I retire. Actually, I have no bucket list right now. Many people keep their bucket list for their retirement. I finished my bucket list before I retired. Now I have an impossible bucket list. Like, for example, you know, I want to end world poverty, or at least poverty in Malaysia. You know, I, I, I want to end, end child abuse for all children. So I have a bucket list right now, which I made especially for impossibilities. But because I'm aware of, of my mortality, partly, of course, as a, a doctor working with children, and seeing enough young children die, you know that this is actually a real reality. So you live a life differently. One of the things I've done, for example, is take my uh, death days. You know what are death days? Death days are days where you intentionally take a day of leave and you go and do something you like to do if you're going to die next week. So you imagine if you're going to die next week, what would you really like to do today? So I've done so many death days. You go and do things which are spectacular in life. Go and watch the stars on a Tasmanian coast in an island where there's no electricity, go to the Himalayas, you know, I've taken death weeks, death months. So I've actually lived my life to the full because I know that the life is brief. And one of the things I encourage people to do because of our briefness is not to hold grudges, to move on, to say, I love you very often. My wife hears I say I love her maybe 20 times a day. It's not a positive thinking, it's just a reality. The first thing in the morning she hears when we wake up while we're still in bed is that I love you. You know, and I think we don't say that enough. We say a lot of negatives, but we don't say positives. And then you might have regret it. Your time is very short or you die suddenly. You never had an opportunity to say all those things to the people. So I encourage people to live their life as though you're going to book course, you're going to die tomorrow and actually say all that you want to say to people and don't hold grudges, let it go. Forgiveness is an important part of living this kind of life. Uh, Doctor uh, well, Ma, I, I have no, I have no words to to describe what we just uh, talked about, uh, except to say that it was hugely uh, enlightening and, and, and touching. So um, I hope to have much more of these conversations with you in the next uh, few weeks or even months. Thank you for talking to me, man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kuh. Huh? Mm -hmm.